So uh, as we were worshiping this morning, Christian came over and gave me this little sticker here. <laughs> and he said, uh, wear this because it will remind you that Jesus died for you. So I go, well, that's nice. So he's learning something. <laughs> but uh, as I begin this morning, I wanted to start you guys off with a story from my childhood. Uh, my mom can attest. Look at her back there. I'm really nervous. I always am always have been. I remember being in elementary school and I had to give a presentation in front of the class and I had a mental breakdown. It was third grade maybe, <laughs> second grade, something like that. And I refused to give it. I refused to give that presentation. I prepared it all and then it was my turn to get up. I just froze, bawled like a little baby. <laughs> so I'm not giving that presentation. So it is a uh, solely by the grace of God that I'm up here sharing with you guys this morning. Uh, <laughs> no tears this morning, no tears. That uh, seems to be about one of the only motions I can share. So my goal this morning is to, to not share the tears, but to share the joy and excitement that uh, God has put in my heart this morning. So... To begin, uh, if you turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 13, I'm going to start in verse 8. Let no debt remain outstanding except, except the continuing debt to love one another, for he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandments do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandments there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now when you, than when you first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. So, a couple of weeks ago, I was praying in the morning and I was asking God, just speak to my heart today. And so about three, it was probably three weeks ago, maybe a month ago, uh, I was sitting in the car on the way to work, and Tiffany and I carpooled because we were close to each other. So I was sitting in the car, and then it clicked. It just hit me. We've been called to love everyone else in this world because regardless of what sin they're in, sin is sin, and Christ died for them. So we've been called to love them and to share the gospel with them. So as, I was, uh, as he was revealing that to me, I saw spots in my own life that I wasn't living it. So then I sat down and uh, Roger said he was going to Indonesia and he asked me to preach. So, well, that's funny because just last week, God put something on my heart. So I stuck with it and I began to prepare. And as I prepared the, prepared the message, God prepared me in my heart to share it. So we've had quite a few instances in the past couple weeks where we've just been given the opportunity to love other people that most people wouldn't love or people did things that most people would get angry about and as Christians we've been called to reach out and love them regardless of what they've done because uh, you know like I said Jesus died for them just as much as he died for us so uh, to start the uh, I wanted to get a couple of definitions out of the way. So in verse 8, it says, Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another, for he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. So I'm sure everyone in here knows the definition of debt. Um, what, do you, what is it, Curtis? I'm throwing you out two words. That's when you owe someone something. That's right. So, as I was looking at the dictionary, because you know, I wanted to be all official and have a dictionary definition. So I found one that was interesting. It said, debt is a state of owing. It's not something that you can just, oh, well, I don't, I don't want that debt anymore. It's something that is a consistent state. It's a way of being. So in this, this verse, my sticker fell off. You just wanted to look at it. But in this verse, 
it uh, is talking about the continuing debt, the, the state of owing others love. And then so then as I began to, to prepare and to study, I had to figure out what the biblical definition of to love is. And so we all know 1 Corinthians chapter 13, so if you guys want to turn to it. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. So, as I was studying, I decided that uh, who better to look for, to for an example than to Jesus and the way He lived on this earth. So I began to prepare and take one of each of the attributes of love described here, described here and figure out where else in Scripture that Christ exemplified this in His life. So to begin, and uh, love is patient. So I saw Jesus' patience with, with His people in Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. Try to get there. So in 10... And it originally it was not... You know, it wasn't uh, something that I really thought about, but then as I began to read it, I realized just, you know, what patience really means. And so it says uh, in verse 35 of chapter 9, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. He called his twelve disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every sickness and disease. So as I began to pray over that, I realized he had called his disciples long before this. But he was patient with them, and then he gave them the gifts when he deemed it was the right time. So in our own lives, we spend so much time wanting stuff now and wanting to do this now. And uh, we're not being patient for God's timing. And we're not showing that patience to other people. We're not, you know, your children misbehave. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of guys' first instinct is to just swat them. You just want to beat them. I don't even have kids, and I already want to spank kids. So. But, uh, you know, that's a perfect example of you can show your patience to your children. You can raise them up in a way that, they're, that they see the patience that you've been given, because we mess up all the time, and Jesus is still patient with us. He still loves us. We've still received His forgiveness and, and His love. So... Uh, and, and work. A lot of us are not patient. Those of us in here who have people under them, when they don't do what they're told, you just you get angry with them. You get frustrated. Just like, why don't you just do what you're told? But in the same way, I mean, God could do that to us every two seconds. Why didn't you do what I told you to do? That person right there is a sinner, and you didn't talk to him. What's the deal? But no, he is patient with us. And He raises us up, and He teaches us. You know, we get saved, and then we start to grow in Him. We don't get saved, and then everything's done. We have to grow in Him and share with others. So then the second thing is love is kind. So if you just a little bit to the left is chapter 9 and verse 18. While He was saying this, a ruler came and knelt before Him. My daughter has just died. But come and put your hand on her, and she will live. Jesus got up and went with them, and so did his disciples. Just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for twelve years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, If I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed from that moment. So Jesus' kindness is portrayed here because she was a, an outcast of society. Anyone that was sick or deemed different, they were outcasts. 
the uh, society didn't accept them. The rulers, the uh, Israelites, the the Pharisees and Sadducees, all of them, they didn't accept people that were had sickness, leprosy, and stuff like that. But Jesus, he said, he healed her. He was kind to her. He showed the love that only God can to someone that is sick and hurting. Because our first instinct for someone who's sick and hurting is we don't want to go there. You know, we uh, I've been in multiple uh, situations where you go downtown or somewhere and you see someone on the side of the road and you don't stop and help them. You know, they're asking for money or whatever they're asking for. But why are we not out reaching those people? Why are we not out there sharing the love that God has given us? <clears throat> so we need to show kindness to others. You know, your spouse gets angry with you. Show them, show them kindness. Do something. You know, for, if you're a husband, go clean the house for your wife. It works. I did it once. <laughs> That's right. And then wives, cook a good meal. All of us, we all love to eat. Not a guy in here doesn't like to eat. Is that right, Kurt? <laughs> Well, there you go. See, you cook a good meal. You're being kind to your husband. But And then people we work with, we'd be kind with them. People out on the street, someone cuts you off. First instinct, oh man, we gotta, we got to get these guys. i got to speed up next to them so I can look at them. Give them the... Uh, give them... Got to give them the look. But instead, what I found myself doing is I wave and smile at them. Because it's, you know, I'm not angry with them. Maybe they didn't see me. Maybe they're in a hurry. I don't know what it is, but I'm just going to be kind to them. Somebody stepped on my new Jordans. No, no. I don't know if any of you guys know the Jordans. Those are real popular, right, Tony? Real popular shoes. You got to keep them clean. People step on them. Your nice, pretty white shoes. It's frustrating, but we've got to be kind to them. <laughs> This, we're talking about first world problems here. <laughs> but, uh, and then the next is to be humble. Love, love is humble. So if we go to John chapter 13. Since I'm monotone, as long as I smile, you guys can tell I'm joking, right? That's right. So, in uh, chapter 13, it was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come to God, come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the, with the towel that was wrapped around him. Jesus portrayed here an, a spirit of humility. You know, people that are in high esteem in, in our society it's hard to go out and take care of those that nobody wants to take care of. You know, we've got, uh, like I said, people downtown or people that are sick that have cancer, people with disabilities. Uh, nobody wants to take care of them. But we've been called to take care of all of those people. Our, uh, our obedience is our humility. You know, we've got to be humble to everything and everyone. I, I could stand up here and I could get a big head because Roger asked me to preach in front of you guys. Oh, look at me. I'm so fancy. <laughs> good. But uh, that would do me no good and it would do new, you guys no good. So as I began to, to pray about this, I realized if I do this in my own power and my own strength, I'll just get up here and talk in my monotone voice and you guys will all look at me and smile. Oh, Thomas, you did a nice job. It's good. Well, isn't that fantastic? I did a nice job. It's great. But my desire is to see each and every one of us grow closer to Christ, not for you guys to tell me that I did a good job. So, as I prepared this week, that was the attitude of my heart, was to come in here 
and not me speak from my own wisdom and understanding, but by the grace of God, come up here before you guys and share what He has for you. <clears throat> and then, love is not self-seeking. Luke chapter 22. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down, and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. A perfect example of not being self-seeking. It would have been so easy, being that Jesus is God, that He would have, this is over, I'm done with this. But instead, the, the glory and the joy set before Him of repairing the relationship with God, that kept Him in a place where He was willing to submit. And so He became sin for us. He became all of, He became the, the tool that fixed our relationship with God. And it, it was so easy, he could have here just stopped it all. But instead, he said, Yet not my will, but yours be done. He was looking out. You know, all the, you see all through the scriptures where he talks about he had compassion for the crowds. He healed their sick. He did all of these things because he loved the people. So he died for each and every one of us so that our standing with God would be right as long as we choose to follow him and submit to him. And this one is the hardest for me, which is to be slow to anger. I don't know what it is. It's just easy to get angry. But if we go to Matthew 14, a little bit of backstory here for those of you that haven't read all of Matthew or don't have it all memorized yet, which is all of us. Um, it talks about John the Baptist being beheaded. And with John the Baptist being a friend of Jesus, and he had just been beheaded, find Jesus must have been in an interesting situation. You know, all, today we all, if we're struggling with something and somebody comes up to us and we're focusing on that struggle, our first instinct is to get snappy. You know, you don't want to help them or you're trying to, oh, I'm trying to deal with my own thing here. But it's interesting what Jesus does when John the Baptist had just been beheaded. And when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds following him on foot, followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. So he had just found out that his friend had been beheaded, but here he is healing people and going out and doing what he had been called to do, what he had been sent to this earth to do, which was to heal the sick and to die for our sins. And so here he is. He has a friend. You know, a lot of us have had friends die in our lifetime. So I don't. it would be hard that as soon as you find out a friend had died, you have this massive crowd in front of you and they're expecting you to heal them and expecting them to teach them and to take care of them. But he did it and he did not get angry. He wasn't angry about it at all. Instead, he saw what the people needed and he did what they needed. It's, it's really easy to get angry in this life, whether it's your spouse, your children, your coworkers, people on the roadways, people at school, whatever it is, it's really easy to get angry. But the world gets angry. And if we're not a part of this world, we've died to the flesh, then there's no need for us to be angry. Regardless of what's done to us or done to others, there should be no anger. There should, there should be a void that's filled with the love that Christ has shown us. So I thought about that in my own life and realized where I'd been getting angry and what I had done. So, man, Lord, I really need some grace right now because... 
I'm out here getting angry. It's the stupidest thing. I ran out of brownies. I, I don't, you guys like co cosmic brownies, the ones with the little candies in them? I haven't had them since I lived with my parents. And uh, Tiffany and I went to the store and they were on sale, so I got a box. And then yesterday I finished that box. <laughs> And so I, I looked at the empty box of brownies and I was frustrated because I wanted another brownie. <laughs> Just the stupidest things that we get angry over. Uh, and then, love shows no record of wrong. Luke chapter 23. Two other men, both criminals, were also led with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebu rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? <clears throat> we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. Love holds no record of wrong. Here is this man dying on the cross next to Jesus for the things he had done in this life. And because of what he accepted, what Christ was doing, Christ said, you will be with me in paradise, regardless of what that guy had just done in his life. So, ISIS, those, they're out there murdering Christians, what, throwing them off the boats, whatever they're doing. But if they were to come to Christ, to come to a knowledge of Him, that is all forgiven, all done. There's no, there's no uh, record of wrong there. He, he's forgiven them for killing people if they choose to follow Him. Uh, the sins in our own life, there's no record of wrong there. It's been wiped away. Christ died for it, we accepted it, wiped away. So how do we live that in our own life? You know, at, at, uh, at work. You have somebody that works under you, they make a mistake. Oh, you know, they, they get their punishment. But then it's done. It's over with. You don't constantly come back to, hey, you remember that time that uh, you stole that thing from my desk? Uh, now you're getting a write-up because you were five minutes late. You, or uh, your husband or wife, they mess up one day, do something wrong, upset you. There's no record of wrong there. You forgive them. You love them. Richard, I know you've told the story about your passed so many times. You know it's a hard day. Yeah. It's a long one. I guess that happens when you're old. <laughs> but uh, the amount of forgiveness that's displayed in your guys' relationship is exactly what living this no record of wrong is. Is that Jesus died for us and now now that we have accepted what He did for us, there's no more record of wrong. Our past is gone. Our old life is gone. Richard, you died to that old stuff. And now you're here daily. You're blessing our church now because of what God has done in your life. So, there's no record of wrong. Some of us are newly married in here. And we want to keep a list of everything our spouse did so we can use it in the next argument. And that's awful because women are always better at that. <laughs> I, 
I can't remember half the stuff Tiffany did. <laughs> Actually, probably three quarters, but uh, she can remember everything. <laughs> but I think that's just how we're wired. But, uh, you know, there's no record of wrong. And it's, it's encouraging because of what he did for us. So we should display that to the world. You know, people persecute us and they're mean to us and they're, they mock us. And Jesus was mocked, beaten, and all of that. And he said, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. So what are we doing? We're saying, oh, well, they wronged us. Oh, write them off, never associating with them again. It's not what we're called to do. And the last one I chose was that love perseveres. And this one is my favorite because it's the hope that we have. And it's in Hebrews chapter 2. Verses 14 and 15. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. So in the end, God's love for his people persevered over sin. Christ died for us, conquered death, and that is the hope that we have. We have perseverance. We have the ability to conquer the sin in our lives because of what Christ did for us. All we have to do is choose to accept it and repent from it. And so as I began to tie this together, I looked at it, and it's, that's perfect that it came at the end of the verse, is that love always perseveres. And that is the greatest hope we have in this life, is that Christ did persevere over death. He destroyed it. Well, there should be no fear in it. And that, that hope we have is what we are to display to others. Not our anger, our frustrations, but the hope that we have. And to tie all of this verse together, we go back to Romans chapter 5. Mark, I think you have this verse memorized. I'm pretty sure. I think I heard you say it. But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The perfect display of 1 Corinthians 13 is the cross of Jesus. What he, he died for us. He was raised from the dead for us. All of that to bring us in a right relationship with God. So every attribute of love is displayed in that. That the, the perfection of God's love was laid out on the cross and when Jesus was resurrected. So begin to, to think about that. How do we live that out? And the, the goal here is to be obedient to what God has done for us and what He's called us to do. So if He's died for us and He was raised for us and we've been called to make disciples to go out and share the gospel with people. And then in 1 John chapter 5, where it talks about that if we love God, we follow His commands. And then it says back in Romans where we first started that the sum of the commands is to love one another. It encompasses all of the other commandments. So if we're to love one another and uh, we're to be obedient to it and the obedience is the way that we show that we love God, then we've been called to do that. We've been called to go out and love everyone, regardless of their sin, regardless of what they do. Everyone deserves to have the gospel shared to them because that's what Christ did. He died for everyone. Everyone in this nation, everyone in this world, regardless of how bad they are. So the worst person you can think of in your life, Christ still died for them. The worst person we can think of in our world, Christ still died for them. It's our calling to go out and be obedient and share with them. So our goal as Christians is to love God, to love one another, and make disciples. And so to, to start, you have to be in a right standing with God. If you don't know Christ, then you need to. I remember the day that I submitted my life to Christ, there was a guy at the church who was crying for me. He said, that is the best decision you ever made. I said, I agree with that to this day. I agree with that. Second is marrying my wife. I'll throw that out there. 
But the first was giving my life to Christ. Because there's no greater, no greater thing in this world than to be sharing with someone else that when they're hurting, you're there. Okay, well, here's what God has said about this. Here's what He can offer you. Here's the hope that we have. We don't grieve like the world because we have hope. And that's what we've been called to share with others. <clears throat> and then after you are in right standing with God, you must die to yourself daily because yourself is going to want to live in this world. Just like you talked about, Richard, dying daily. Dying to that old nature. Every day I get up and the anxiety wants to come back. So, oh man, here comes an anxiety attack. But the power that I have received through what God has done for me. So what's a little anxiety? What if my heart races a little bit? I get clammy, I get sweaty, I stink a little bit because I'm so sweaty. It doesn't matter because God overcame all that and He's given me hope. Because I hope, you know what we have back here, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things below. If our focus is that, then the little things don't matter. The little anxieties, the little worries, the big worries, the big anxieties, whatever they are, no matter how big, God has already conquered it in His love for us. So, so now, if we reflect on that and what He's done for us, then we have to display it to others by being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. You just can't go to anybody and say whatever you want. You have to be sensitive to the Spirit because when the Spirit is moving, that's where you go. Uh, you know, where was it Ruth that Roger's been preaching on where um, Ruth said she would follow no matter where she went. That should be our commitment with the Holy Spirit. Wherever the Holy Spirit's going, that's where I'm going. That's the person I'm going to share with because God's moving in that person. So we've got to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And in that, if you turn to Jude, the little itty-bitty baby book at the back, Verse 22, Be merciful to those who doubt, snatch others from the fire and save them. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. In this, being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. To some people you show mercy because that's what they need. To other people you show fear. To other people you just reach out but hey, stop what you're doing. Don't you know that Christ died for you so you can be set free from that? But you have to be sensitive to where God is moving. You have to be in a constant state of look, being kingdom-minded, like Roger says, where that's your focus, being sensitive to where God is moving, where His Spirit's going, where the people are that need the understanding. We have so many people in this church that have come to know Christ in the, the years that I've been here. And it's great to see because we have a church family who is committed to being where the Spirit's moving. Mary Jo, all the Bible studies that you've had with people at work or the, the talking that you've had with other people, there's people in this church that have come to know Christ because of your obedience to share with what God has put on your heart. So we have to be sensitive. There's other people that will shoot you down. Oh, no, I don't want a part of that. Tiffany had her first experience with that got shot down. It stings the first time. But there's people out there that don't want to hear it. So our goal is to be sensitive to where God is moving so we can go there and share, Emily, you've come to know Christ recently within the past two years. And it's great, isn't it? It is great. You've, you've come to know Christ through Mary Jo's obedience. Yeah, and all the other, all the people in your life, it was always the Christians, right? Mm -hmm. Always the Christians, because they're being obedient to God's calling. I, I don't know how many people in this church have been saved and come to know Christ since Rogers become the pastor, but we have a pastor who is obedient to God to a fault. And so if we're to follow Him, we should also follow His lead to be Christ-like and to be obedient in love. I remember when I was a teenager, I always thought pastors were these guys that stood up front and you couldn't talk to them, you couldn't be their friend. 
I think I've told Mary Jo and Roger this story a few times that uh, all of that was just blown right out of the water when uh, the day I was baptized we were out having a water gun fight and here you see Roger in his suit running, a, flying across the yard with a water gun shooting all the little kids. <laughs> And so having fun and goofing around is a part of being obedient because people build that relationship with you and they feel comfortable to start to share with you and then you have an opportunity to go in and just start to share with them, share the hope that you have. A silly little water gun fight and it just absolutely blew my mind that a pastor could do that. And so to end... I had two thoughts that I thought were common in the church today. And the first is it's the pastor's job. It's the pastor's job to share. He's the preacher. He gets, we bring the people into the church. He preaches to them. People get saved. We go about our business. And that's what's wrong with the church in America today. We spend so much time focusing on bringing people into the pews that we don't focus on taking care of the heart problem. You know, the... Uh, Roger told you guys I'm doing an in-depth Ephesians study. And one of the things in Ephesians talks about the church and the church being the body of Christ. So we spend so much time bringing people into the church that aren't a part of, a part of the body and we wonder why we have dissension in the church. Instead, we have been called to be out sharing the gospel with people and making disciples. And then we bring them into the body of Christ and we serve God together. That's what church is. Church is not a building. Church is not a place where we get together and hang out with friends. It is a place where we serve God together with brothers and sisters in Christ. Where Jesus is the head and the Holy Spirit's the blood. So if a person is not a part of the body, of course people are going to say there's hypocrites in church. Because there are. The church in America is full of them. They don't belong to the body of Christ. They've never bended their knee and bowed their hearts. And the devil has done a great thing in that. He has made us a weak faith in America. He has gotten into people's lives, into people's hearts, to the point where all our focus is is the government and bringing people to church. All we care about is who's running for what, or if they stand for this. If we take more time to go out and uh, preach the gospel to people and share what Christ has done for them, their hearts change and their voting changes. Their voting doesn't change because you have an argument with them about something that's right or wrong. Because the Bible says that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. So, if those people are already in a different place than we are, what does it matter? The, the government, what they do, what other people do, doesn't matter a bit. I mean, what did the government do to Jesus? They, they just washed their hands of Him. Be done. So that regardless of what we do, they're going to do that. So we need to be out affecting the people around us, sharing the gospel with them, show, showing them God's love and what He displayed for us. And the second thought is that, well, I don't know enough to go out and share with somebody. I just got saved. I don't know what I'm doing. But as I was reading, if you look in uh, 1 Corinthians where Paul is talking and he wrote to them he said when I came to you brothers I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith may not rest in men's wisdom but on God's power. So here's Paul, a guy that wrote all these letter to all, letters to all these churches, was a leader of the church, and here he is saying, I didn't know anything when I first came to you guys except for Christ and Him crucified, which is the most important. That is what we're supposed to be sharing in this life, is Christ and Him crucified and then Him raised from the dead for us for our sake to conquer sin in our lives. So for those of you that don't know your whole Bible like me, I don't know my whole Bible. I don't know a lot of it. I'm only 26, so I still have 50 years to learn the rest of it. But uh, the hope we do have is that we can go to a God that 
is wise and knows everything and that as long as we ask for it and we are obedient, God will give us wisdom. It may come in little snippets here, little snippets there, but we are in a constant state of becoming wiser. And so in your walk, I, I hope to encourage you guys that regardless of how little or how much you know, that our power does not come from our own words and our own understanding, but from what God has done for us. So this week, I pray that you guys would go out and share the gospel with people, to share the good news of Christ, to what He's done for you and what He's done in everybody in this church's life. There's so many good stories with you guys and what to, has been accomplished in your life. Todd, great example. The alcohol and everything that God conquered in, in your life through the bended knee that you submitted to Christ. All of that was accomplished. It was, already, it was already available to you. You just had to seek it out. And Dar is Darren here this morning? A little, little disc. Just a little disc. Out having fun, having a blast. And that little disc was the vessel that God used to completely change Todd's life turn it upside down and just save him from what he had been doing. And so that's the goal we have, is to go out and just change our world, to go out and change the, what people are doing, and we change it through our bended knee, our submission to God, and to be obedient in, his, in loving others. So I think that's about it this morning. I'm going to leave it at that before I mess anything up. So, so Richard, you want to close us?